have identified some very, very interesting anomalous um, type of aircraft. The traffic is quite luminous and is exhibiting some anomalistic motion over. It uh, moved very rapidly at any speed or whether any direction it wanted to go. Why it could change and go to the right or the left or go crossways uh, without hesitating a bit. What do you think it was? Well, if they call it a flying saucer, that's what it is. EWA-517, do you want to report a UFO? Over. Negative. We don't want to report. Look, it won my worst Wednesday night. I am fascinated by these topics because our archive is pretty different than the rest of those uh, being presented. I'm going to give a little bit of uh, background on on myself and how I came to found the archives and uh, my own investigations into these phenomena and the, the many uh, varieties of these phenomena that uh, proliferate across the state of, of Texas. And uh, then I'm going to focus in on some examples from our archives of original primary data and the challenge of researching belief-driven folklore with a focus on UFO sightings and the alien abduction phenomena. So I grew up fantastically obsessed with these strange phenomena, UFO, science fiction, psychic phenomena. I, as a child, read everything I could get my hands on in my elementary school library, my middle school library, and my high school library. Of course, by the time of high school, I had started collecting my own books on these subjects and uh, doing my own uh, investigations and looking into the wide variety of phenomena that, as I say, are, are extant across Texas from uh, the Marfa Lights in West Texas to the Ball of Light phenomena in East Texas uh, in the Big Thicket, where there are also many, many Bigfoot sightings and other cryptid sightings uh, up in the north part of the state. There, of course, uh, was a, a infamous case called the Goatman sighting. Um, and down here in Austin, uh, there is a rich uh, lore and, and in history of strange phenomena, occult, esoteric, metaphysical, UFO, parapsychological uh, connections to uh, the city of Austin. And um, all of this led me on my own journey. And uh, upon graduating from high school, I was working at the city of Austin's public library downtown, and I was working in the periodicals department and processing the newspapers and magazines. And one of the magazines that we had uh, a subscription to was the MUFON Journal, Mutual UFO Network, one of the largest civilian UFO research organizations in the world. At that time, was headquartered in Seguin, Texas, of all places, had been there for years because that's where the director lived. Uh, it's since moved on, but uh, the the I, through that magazine, I discovered that right next door to the downtown public library at the Austin History Center were regular meetings of the Austin MUFON chapter, the local chapter of the Mutual UFO Network. Uh, over time, I began uh, uh, attending these meetings, um, and eventually I would actually become the leader of that local group. Uh, I also discovered around the same time a, a brand new group was started that was uh, an abduction support group. And even though I hadn't had experiences, it was open to the public and I started attending and made some great lifelong friends. We are a 501c3 nonprofit. Our actual name is Scientific Anomaly Institute, but we call ourselves the Anomaly Archives. As I mentioned, Austin MUFON was kind of my door to a whole new w range of, of uh, people and uh, interests in this style, people uh, that were learning how to become uh, field investigators. Texas has a, a illustrious history of, of hosting the uh, annual conferences of this international organization. There's been conferences in Clear Lake City, San Antonio, and in Austin in uh, the 1990s. And this 1990 period was really my obsessive expansion of my interest in all of these subjects. I would go on to 
found my own self-published zine called Elf Infested Spaces, ELF Infested Spaces, Journal of Possible Paradigms. I published that in print form for many years. This led me on a, uh, a wide range of investigations of all these different subjects I've mentioned, including uh, the weird electromagnetic connections to these strange phenomena, whether it be paranormal hauntings or UFO close encounters or claims of uh, mind control conspiracies and whatnot. Uh, in 2001, I was going to host the National UFO Conference's 38th annual conference. Uh, this unfortunately ill-fated event was canceled due to the tragic events of September 11th, but it was going to be a three-day, three-night fantastic event here in Austin at uh, the original Alma Draft House, which of course has now grown to many, many locations. Uh, in the wake of that uh, event being canceled, uh, friends and I started this local newspaper magazine called Austin Para Times. We, of course, investigated uh, all the Bigfoot conferences that were going on, reported on JFK assassination conferences that were going on, and talked to a lot of people in all these different fields. And my time spent in the zine scene of the 1990s really led me to a wealth of, of individuals who were themselves seekers in these various areas of research. And I've just continued uh, that expansion of my uh, my own personal collections, all of which eventually led me to the founding of the Anomaly Archives. I do want to take a second to talk about the work of, or to at least bring your attention to the work of a good friend of mine, anthropologist Susan Lepselter. She was actually researching her dissertation for uh, her anthropology degree at the University of Texas during the height of the abduction scene in the 1990s. I mentioned the Austin MUFON meetings and the uh, Austin Abductee Support Group meetings. These were, you know, the scene was exploding. There were a lot of people coming forward with these these strange, often horrific and and uh, interesting uh, tales of, of close contact with uh, seeming alien other, some other kind of intelligence. And uh, even though she did all that research back in the 1990s, uh, this book of hers, The Resonance of Unseen Things, Poetics, Power, Captivity, and UFOs in the American Uncanny, was published only uh, as recently as 2016. It's a fantastic book, highly recommend it, and it's uh, got a lot of great information that is of a more academic bent, and, and books like this that she also appears in uh, have a number of great uh, resources that you can find that give a real different perspective than the popular literature, the folklore of these uh, phenomena moving right along. So yes, I founded this Anomaly Archives in uh, 2003. It was initially founded with the uh, about a thousand books of my own that I'd collected on, on my own, as well as with the help of a good friend named Wesley Nations, who I'll mention in just a second. The main goal of our archive is uh, the preservation and dissemination of information about these collections. So we're not just a popular lending library. We have over 7,000 titles in the collection, the vast majority of which are non-circulating research materials, rare books on a wide variety of topics, everything from alchemy in Atlantis to parapsychology and UFOs. UFOs and parapsychology are perhaps the, the biggest uh, sections that we have. And our other mission goals include the research and analysis of these accumulated collections and the public education uh, about them. So here we are. So I mentioned uh, my good friend, West Nations. Uh, he was my entree uh, locally in Austin to the uh, the alternative media zine scene of the 1990s. He was self-publishing a fantastic magazine called Crash Collusion. But eventually he wanted to move on to a different environment and donated half of his collection to me and the other half to his then editor of the magazine and went on to become a, uh, a very popular travel blogger called Johnny Vagabond. We miss you, Wes. Uh, as I say, I was meeting all these amazing people through the alternative media zine scene. These were conspiracy magazines, dream magazines, parapsychology zines, magic, psychedelics, all forms of esoterica and the occult. Uh, we now have well over 2,000 periodicals. You can see here in the picture there, just a few of those. Uh, we, we still have tons of magazines that we're still processing. Over the years, uh, we were even though we were founded in 2003, we've only existed at three different locations. Our most recent location was this fantastic facility in downtown Austin, right on the interstate. And uh, we were there for just three years. Unfortunately, that last year, of course, we weren't really able to do much of anything due to the, to the pandemic. And this is where we're very different than these other organizations that you're hearing these fantastic presentations from. 
We are an independent nonprofit, no paid staff, it's all volunteer run, and we have a very small, one might say non-existent budget. And uh, the ripple effects of the pandemic have hurt us tremendously. We lost our lease and we are currently in storage. And so it's a tragedy that we are trying to rectify. So if you have any great affordable locations that you know about here in Austin, Texas, you can email me at contact at anomalyarchives.org. So we have a wide variety of collections. We have collections donated by past life hypnotherapy regression therapists. We have collections donated by, like I said, the my friend West Nations uh, and my own. The former editor of the MUFON UFO Journal, who also used to write for Omni Magazine, has donated some of his material. The, the collection keeps expanding. And one of the last collections that we were in the process of acquiring when the pandemic lockdowns hit was that of Robert Durant, who was a former pilot who was researching everything from cryptozoology to the Roswell UFO crash to UFOs in general, and also parapsychology. He was very keenly interested in remote viewing. And in this picture here, uh, you see him on the left and on the right is the very famous uh, psychic Ingo Swan, who was pretty much at the center of the intelligence agency's secret remote viewing projects that were going on at Stanford Research Institute. One of the researchers of uh, that Stanford research project into remote viewing is from here in Austin and still lives here in Austin and is still connected to all these strange things, including Tom DeLonge's To the Stars Academy, which made headlines in uh, 2017 with the subsequent revelation about the Pentagon's UFO UAP investigation program. Our biggest collection came to us in 2014 when I was contacted by a former head of MUFON who uh, is one member of an, an interesting uh, UFO organization called the UFO Research Coalition, which is a coalition of people from MUFON, FUFER, and KUFOS. Yes, we uh, UFO, UFO folks love our acronyms. Uh, in fact, one of these papers here, Near Miss with the UFO, was co-authored by said collection that we have, Robert Durant. And we received about 3,000 books from this donation from the UFORC from this famous fellow. I say famous, he's not really well known except for those intensely interested in these subjects and who were around in the 1990s. Uh, that's Robert Charles Gerard, Bob Gerard, who passed away in 2011. Uh, we were gifted with his collection and it's it's our biggest and best collection. He's most well known for his catazine. He published these catalog magazines where he would do micro reviews of everything that he was selling. He was a rare book collector and seller. We were given his actual personal collection of thousands of materials, whereas uh, MUFON ended up with his, his actual inventory of books that he was selling. Uh, he was also described by John Chambers as the Marcel Proust of UFO phenomena because of those micro reviews. He would write you know, these reviews of everything new that was coming out, as well as everything that had been published before. Uh, he was also f featured in the Discovery Channel documentary, Farewell Good Brothers, about the UFO contactee movement. He's a very interesting character, and he did also self-publish a number of materials, including this book, Future Man, Elements of the Equation, Revolt of the Free, and this nice little one, Mice, an allegory about the alien abduction and UFO phenomenon. There's, of course, a number of famous uh, abductees associated with Texas, that being uh, Whitley Schrieber, the former science fiction and horror writer. Of course, a lot of his experiences happened in upstate New York at his cabin there, but he also grew up in San Antonio, Texas, and had a number of strange experiences as a child there. Another fantastic book, Report on Communion, was written about his experiences by Ed Conroy, who has since become a board member of the Anomaly Archives. We're proud to have Ed as uh, our newest board member. And Ed is one of those people, and as Willie uh, uh, can attest as well, that has suffered from the ridicule and the laughter curtain associated with the abduction phenomenon. Ed Conroy was a journalist at the San Antonio Express News, but unfortunately uh, lost his job due to his reporting on such a ultra topic as UFOs and alien abductions. Probably not going to have enough time to go through this, but Ray Stanford is an, a controversial figure as so many are in the UFO field, uh, he did one of the most instrumented research uh, projects in the world where uh, here in Austin, outside of town on Lake Travis, he had uh, lasers, magnetometers, uh, radar, and a number of other instruments trying to document scientifically the UFO phenomena. This is the, an outgrowth, though, of his less than scientific research into channeling. He was an active psychic channeler. 
He is still around and has gone on to become a prolific fossil finder. He somehow seemingly uses his psychic abilities to find fossils more than most others. He's a fascinating character. I'd love to talk to you more about him, but I'm going to move right along. But interestingly enough, one of the Project Blue Book unidentified cases was his. It occurred in 1967 on the anniversary of the birth of the modern UFO era, June 24th, you know, from Blue Book. Investigations from 1947 to 1969, they they investigated over 12,000 sightings and had over 700 remaining unidentified, and his was one of those. I'm going to have to skip over here for time was this audio clip of him describing that famous unidentified case. In 1967, uh, June, on the, on the anniversary of the Ken O'Donnell thing, I had gone out along by myself uh, out to the Mansfield Dam. So uh, another uh, abductee in Austin who I met through the abductee support group and the Austin MUFON group was a woman named Josie Gallant, who, to the best of my knowledge, has unfortunately passed away. She moved away many, many years ago. We have archived her website, Red World, where she featured a lot of her different art. Uh, You can see a sample of it here down in the corner. That's kind of a nativity scene, but with aliens. And uh, one of the rare things that we have in our collection is this video from Access community television here in Austin that features her artwork uh, alongside some didgeridoo that may actually be by another Austin experiencer who actually donated her collection to me. But here's just a quick sample of that audio and video. I'm going to skip this video here, but this is video of a researcher named Lloyd Pye, who apparently started linking his favorite topic, the quote unquote star child skull, a strange skull that he claimed to have obtained from someone in El Paso, Texas in February 1999. Most evidence seems to point to this being a malformed human skull of a child who died of congenital hydrocephalus uh, enlarged uh, head. And um, he links it to the work of uh, and the artwork of Josie Gallant. Now, Josie's uh, experiences, to the best of my knowledge, have never actually been investigated or or really uh, documented except through her artwork and through her letter writing to researchers like Lloyd Pye. And this is not the first example of people linking mystery remains of probable, pretty identifiable native people's skeletons as paranormal evidence for uh, UFO alien uh, belief systems. It also touches on the very touchy area of the alien-human hybrid fetus dealing aspect of the alien abduction phenomena, uh, which may have connections to such things as phantom pregnancies. But this gets to the level of investigation in such cases being very minimal and the transmission of these stories being the perpetuation of, of modern folklore. I'm not passing any judgment on these experiences. I'm kind of a militant agnostic. I don't know and neither do you. But I think it's best to try to uh, promote a rational investigation of these subjects. Carla Turner was, or Candy, after her middle name Candace, earned her BA from California State University, her MA from University of Nottingham in England, and her PhD in Old English Studies from the University of North Texas, go UNT. And uh, she came onto the scene in the early 90s, publishing a book into the fringe about her family's experiences with alien abduction. She is significant in that her books got a wide audience. And as you can see, one of those was uh, translated into Japanese and other languages. Her next book, Taken, the in- Inside the Alien Human Abduction Agenda, featured seven different women who were experiencers or abductees. Carla was really instrumental in putting forth some very interesting ideas. I loved her research and I, I thought she was a, a very forward thinker. She put forth this idea that the UFO encounters, the alien abduction experience was a kind of what she called virtual reality scenario where the phenomena or the intelligences behind it were actually in control of the perceptions of the experiencer, the incontrant, the abductee. And um, this was a kind of a radical idea. And uh, her sudden death has spawned a number of conspiracy theories that um, uh, have to do with the idea that her information was being suppressed. Well, one of the people in that book turns out to be a local Austin MUFON member who I undoubtedly met but did not know at the time when I read Taken 
that she was one of the people featured in the book. And uh, this is uh, Jane Gent Genthy, who uh, is a self-professed trans medium. Uh, she passed away several years ago, and we uh, were gifted her her personal library of UFO books and her voluminous personal diaries, her dream journals, and all these binders of material, including photographs documenting uh, her UFO sightings and the strange marks that she was finding on her body, like so many abductees report. She had gotten in contact with Carla Turner and ended up as, I believe, chapter six, Jane, in the book Taken. And in that chapter, we read, something deep and profound has been occurring to me since July 1992, she said. If you ask me if I've been abducted, I have to honestly say I have no absolute memory per se. I can only point to my scars and say I think something has happened, but I cannot remember. Only flashes of things, and I'm not sure I can trust the flashes. And Carla Turner goes on to say, from these research records and my investigations, the following account emerged showing the presence of the of an abduction history. In Jane's case, several things are noteworthy. For one, the frequency of her UFO sightings is well above that of the typical abductee, and several of them were multiply witnessed or photographed. Also, while Jane has not recalled a conscious encounter, most of her memories have come from conscious flashbacks rather than dreams. Her dreams, by the way, are vivid and frequently recalled, but they seem only occasionally to contain alien-related information, and this is usually in a screened form. Finally, Jane's experiences have involved a number of telepathic communications and sudden knowings of messages or information. Now, that's not unusual in the abduction phenomena. While there is often physical evidence cited to try to corroborate the physical reality of these experiences, they often involve dreams or flashes or consciously recalled information. One thing Carla Turner was criticized for was her perhaps over-reliance on hypnosis as a source of information. So I would just go on to say that we're very blessed to have in this collection this this copy of a copy of, of Carla's book that includes the annotations. You can see where Jane had annotated all the other abductees whom she was in communication with that were part of Carla's book, and which unfortunately document the the suicide, the death by heart attack, the being an MS survivor in a wheelchair, and of course, of course, Carla's death. There's some very also other great informa information in here in uh, these many different tomes that uh, were left behind, including this multi-witness sighting of a, a triangular-shaped UFO craft over Lago Vista, uh, Lake Travis, in, in uh, just outside Austin, Texas, and this newspaper article that you can see here. So we've got her MUFON report, her UFO sighting report to MUFON, which unfortunately, the reports that are online, you can't access this because they only started putting online the ones that were entered online. Uh, they haven't digitized all those. So we, this is a good example of where, you know, primary material, uh, having access to that actually is is better than what you have available uh, in, in the online environment. And lastly, I was going to play this extended clip of Jane talking to Carla, uh, or it's a, a letter in the form of an audio cassette because she uh, also left behind a lot of audio cassettes. And I'll just give a quick sampling of that. It's the 20th of May. 1993 letter to Dr. Carla Turner, Jane Kimpy, and hi, Carla. Boy, do I have stories to tell you. So if anybody is interested, they can go to our website, anomalyarchives.org. You can email me at contact at anomalyarchives.org if you have any questions. Uh, we do, when we can, when the pandemic allows, uh, do outreach such as uh, at the Austin Archives Bazaar or more recently at the other world's Austin Film Festival that was uh, held just a few years ago. And lastly, here is a piece of that art that you saw by Jane Gantz, um, one of several, but this is the one that we were allowed to. 